I'm now here with David Griscom. You, of course, know him as co-host of the excellent show, Left Reckoning. He is also a contributor to Jacobin and, of course, friend of the show. Uh, David, it has been far too long. It's really good to see you. No, it's really great seeing you too, Jen. So I wanted to have you on today to talk about something uh, which I think is pretty interesting, and that is the topic of patriotism. Uh, now, obviously, I, I, I know that you have some good thoughts on this, um, but I, I guess I'll set us up a little bit by just mentioning that, of course, you know, among progressives and on the left, I think patriotism or the concept of patriotism is often very contentious, right? And for good reason. Um, everybody watching this, of course, knows that the U.S. has a very checkered history, uh, to say the least, of, you know, genocide, slavery, uh, imperialism. And I want to say, especially on that last point, you know, I was a teenager during the, the George W. Bush administration, uh, which means, you know, after 9-11, uh, we had a kind of massive expansion of the security state, the war on terror, and of course, uh, very costly interventions overseas. And I, I bring that up because during this time period, as I'm sure you probably remember as well, patriotism in the U.S., or I, I should say there was a huge push among both the political class and the media apparatus to uh, equate patriotism in the U.S. with being pro-war, being pro-intervention, being pro-war on terror. George W. Bush literally said, if you're not with us, you're against us in the fight against terrorism. I think we, you know, if you were alive during that time, I think that you remember that. Uh, and so obviously, you know, that's all to say that in our not very recent history, patriotism, at least, you know, on the part of the on the part of elites has been really pushed as a as something that's synonymous with like heavy nationalism, jingoism, uh, and xenophobia. Now, all of that said, uh, the question that I want to pose to you is, given all of that, is it possible for socialists to kind of adopt a kind of pro-Americanism or patriotism that is not synonymous with those things? Uh, can and should socialists be patriots? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's a it's obviously a bit complicated, and I think that um, you know there there's a lot of themes that that go into this, and particularly there's a lot of like just to be clear, like very very left online debates about this that, that are happening right now, and like you know to talk about like you know patriotism or whatever, it's like you know there's some people uh, who sometimes come up on the left with this like bright idea, um, you know, which is never going to work. That if we just hug the flag a little bit better, give it a couple kisses, then we're somehow going to, you know, undo decades and decades of of losses that we've experienced in this country. So of course, I think that that's absolutely foolish. Um, but I also do find that on our side, a lot of people, and it's a product of of our system, mm -hmm. um, are sort of purposefully like ignorant of the the history of this country. And I mean, maybe, I, I want to talk maybe about a couple examples in, in a moment, but just like. To think about it, like there's a reason for that. Um, you know, like here in Texas, for example, like there is a huge fight about how we teach history in our public education system, mm -hmm. and it's a fight that the right wing is winning. Yeah. Um, and I think it's really important, um, you know, that we're pushing back against that and recognizing that, you know, one of the things that they really do want to do is they want to erase all of this history of resistance, of kind of alternative paths for this country, because. Unlike, I think, what a lot of leftists sometimes think, you know, American history was not just one kind of like slow march of, you know, brutal capitalism, right. private property, love and boys. Right. Um, at every moment, there were people who were resisting. And, yeah, the fact is they lost. But I find myself as a, as a socialist, um, you know, and also as an American that I think it's very worthwhile to see yourself as a part of this long tradition of trying to fight for a much, much better world. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree. And uh, something I was just thinking about is, you know, the late great Eugene Debs, uh, I think, has many choice quotes about the dangers of patriotism. Uh, you know, he has a very famous quote about how, like, the ruling class and tyrants uh, just love to wrap themselves up in the cloak of patriotism to exploit and oppress, uh, you know, the working masses. Um, he has a famous line where he says something like, I have no country, I'm a citizen of the world, right? And obviously, this, this sort of degree of uh, internationalism has always been in part of socialism, and, and we should talk about that more. Um, now, that said, I think that Debs is a great example because, you know, despite him saying all of that, I think in his own way, he was 
a patriot. Um, I think that he also, again, is part of a very American tradition. Uh, he, the man ran for president like five times, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, on the subject of war and nationalism and jingoism, like he was a great early anti-war uh, advocate. And again, as you were saying, that is also part of a very, very American tradition. Uh, so that's to say that like, I, I think it's clear that I I feel like there is a place for kind of hearkening back to those traditions and calling them American and not shying away from the idea that they are part of the American tradition. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I suppose a follow up question is um, to to what extent should the left lean into this kind of Americanism, right, or this kind of pro American sentiment? Because like I think as we've been hinting, it seems like at a certain point you might start to be playing with fire a little bit, or 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 are Definitely. you? Yeah, no, I mean, um, you know, I think it's, it's uh, Lawrence Goodwin, uh, the book above my head right now, the the populist moment, right? Talking about the American Populist Party. Um, and he has a, an interesting line in the introduction there where he says, you know, in America, because we have had such a lack of class parties, mm -hmm. regionalism and nationalism have sort of like replaced that space yeah. in politics. Um, and I think that, you know, um, this is why we desperately need to be building, you know, class rooted, um, you know, organizations that do recognize that kind of common, common, like, um, you know, brotherhood or whatever term you want to use of like the global working class and the historic working class. Um, but I think a lot of people are very confident and comfortable with saying things like that and then sort of mix it with this disdain of you know a kind of average american yeah. character and i think a lot of that is imported um from a lot of liberalism like mm -hmm. i'm just gonna you know I'll, I'll say it right now like i you know i grew up um you know <laughs> around a lot of hippies and um you know they were always very worked up about you know cheeseburgers and you know the nfl <laughs> and things like that right and you see that just is so commonplace i think in a lot of kind of left-wing um mm -hmm. communities and, and spaces and i think it's incredibly alienating yeah. Um, you know, and like, like, just be really clear, like talking about any form of like patriotism, if you don't mind, I have a, I have a little quote here yeah. um, that I think sort of underlines what I'm talking about. Um, so this is and people should watch. There's a really great dramatic uh, reenactment of this uh, with James Earl Jones voicing the great uh, socialist and American Paul Robeson, who was pulled in front of the House of Un-American Activities. Um, and I'll just read a quick segment from it because I think this really hits at what I'm at least trying to get at, where it's not some kind of rose colored, mm -hmm. you know, rosy colored like glasses view of history, but it's actually recognizing that there is a historical debt um, that working class people deserve um, that, that is paid. So uh, Mr. Ro uh, Paul Robeson is talking about his experience in Russia, which is why he was being brought up. And he says, in Russia, I felt for the first time like a full human being. No color prejudice like in Mississippi. No color prejudice like in Washington. It was the first time I felt like a human being when I did not feel the pressure of color as I feel it in this committee today. And then one of the people who is, you know, grilling him says, well, then why did you not stay in Russia? This is the this is the bit that, you know, really moves me. Mm -hmm. Robeson says, because my father was a slave and my people died to build this country and I'm going to stay here and have a part in it just like you mm -hmm. and no fascist minded people will drive me from it. Is that clear? Right. And like this sort of embodies the kind of spirit that like, at least I, I try to promote in like reclaiming a bunch of, of this history is that yeah. like, we have this really, you know, strong history. It's a lot of it is incredibly tragic. Right. Yeah. Um, but there are debts that deserve to be paid. And I don't think that we should evacuate, um, you know, that, that, that to the right wing, who's very willing um, to, you know, do a kind of make believe version of, of American history. Right. Um, but our reaction to that shouldn't be completely ceding ground to them right. on like who has the traditions here, because, right. you know, the, the left in this country has been here from the get go. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we, we have a historical debt that needs to be paid. And we also have people um, who we should be, you know, learning from um, as well. I, I, I want to now ask you about uh, like, how that factors into our political strategy and our political yeah. messaging now. And this, okay, I admit this is like a little bit of a cop out, but I think that someone like Bernie Sanders is really good at sort of threading the needle between, um, like, I don't think that there's anybody who questions that Bernie Sanders is a patriot legitimately. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, he, you know, has never shied away from criticizing America's shortcomings. And like I said, I think that he manages to thread that needle very well. And something I was thinking about is, I think part of the reason 
reason why he's so good at it, like, isn't because he's like, you know, uh, like master like orator or anything like that, but because he's just very clear that, for example, he's super pro-veteran, but at the same time, mm-hmm. anti-war, anti-Pentagon spending, right? He's very pro-American worker, pro-American manufacturing, anti-free trade, but at the same time, pro-immigrant, pro-immigration. And uh, I, I think that, you know, not everybody, but I think that sometimes uh, progressives and, you know, people on the left uh, have s- have struggled to kind of pull those things apart uh, the way mm. that I think he has. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. And, and you know, if you see, if you see place, if you see room for like a little bit of light flag waving, so to speak, <laughs> in our modern political strategy. I mean, I think um, more than anything, you know, what, what you're getting at is that like Bernie Sanders has something that is very visceral, like it doesn't yeah. take much investigation um, to to feel it, to understand it, that he has a genuine love of like the people and like the broad sense in this idea that, no, we shouldn't accept, um, you know, that in a country, as Bernie Sanders always says, that, you know, has so much wealth that there are, you know, nearly 30 million people who are hungry. Mm-hmm. We shouldn't accept, um, you know, for example, like what's happening here in Texas, um, <clears throat> Where people who are in the National Guard being pulled up to the border for a political stunt right. uh, for Abbott are dying on on are like literally dr- drowning in the Rio Grande and not being uh, taken care of um, mm-hmm. on the other side. Like their families don't get um, you know a, a killed in action um, pension like they would if they were to be sir if they were to be killed in the line of duty if they were called up by the federal government. Right? We shouldn't accept these kinds of things. Yeah. And that comes out of one, like, you know, a a correct moral position that like there's a lot of abuse in this country, but it also comes from a deep love of the people in this country and saying they Mm -hmm. deserve a hell of a lot more than what they've been getting. And I think that that, you know, I I, I find that that's so much more um, motivating than any kind of like symbolic, you know, flag waving kind of thing. I think really rooting it in people rather than rooting it in symbols, I think is the best kind of political tactic that we should be. Um, you know, following, but like, you know, I, I, again, I think that there are some people who get uncomfortable with even saying things like, I love the American people. Like, I think the American people are, are truly wonderful. And like, I say this as somebody who grew up very poor in this country, you know, whenever, um, and obviously I would much prefer there to be a social welfare state that was taking care of us more, but whenever somebody was down and out, people would show up and they yeah. would, they would bring food. People didn't have nothing. And like, that's something that will stick with me forever. Mm-hmm. Um, and, 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 you know, really inspires a lot of my politics, my motivation, um, for promoting these ideas, because I know that like, there is a, you know, a soul in, in this, in this people that is very egalitarian, that is very community oriented. And I think that those are traditions that we should in- certainly, uh, be incorporating, um, in, mm-hmm. in our politics. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, again, like Mike Davis, uh, you know, says that, you know, uh, Contrary to like what a lot of people think about the working class movement in this country, it's not that there hasn't been a working class movement in this country, it's that every time they've had a confrontation with capital, they got beat and they got beat extremely bad. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's like it's like to honor them and also to bolster ourselves so that we don't go into the fights that are in front of us. Um, <laughs> ignorant, you know, yeah. without learning the lessons from, from history, that we do try to, to spend some time rooting ourselves mm-hmm. in this really strong and proud tradition of mm-hmm. American working class uh, politics. So again, like for me, like the question of patriotism is always going to be less about, you know, if you're wearing the right, you know, right. flag lapel or something like that, <laughs> and more about having a genuine um, love and, and care and belief and a fundamental belief um, in the kind of revolutionary potential of of American people, just like you, sh- uh, you know, just like I share that um, with my revolutionary belief in the Bolivian people or, or the Mexican people or the Brazilian people, right? Mm-hmm. But, but like for some reason, <laughs> I think some people on our side have a very hard time um, sort of doing that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, uh, so on that question, uh, do you see patriotism necessarily at odds with internationalism? And, you know, I I had sort of mentioned this before, but I want to bring up the Bernie Sanders example again, because I think that if there's something that people on the left were kind of constantly like hitting him on, it was his foreign policy, right? Or like that lack thereof. And like, just to be clear, like, I think that Bernie Sanders foreign policy, which uh, I'm obviously, you know, uh, summarizing quite a bit, but kind of, you know, uh, it I would say that you could sort of characterize it as like a dovish anti-interventionism, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, he's very clear that he thinks that he, he's he's a kind of like classic guns or butter sort of politician where he wants the money to be spent here in the U.S. rather than, you know, in foreign interventions and, and on the mm-hmm. Pentagon. Uh, but 
you can contrast him with somebody like Jeremy Corbyn, right, on the other side of the ocean, who I think kind of, uh, for better or for worse, sort of evinces more of like an internationalist spirit, or at least had that reputation as a politician. Uh, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Do you see the two as being at odds? That's, I mean, that's, that's a, I mean, uh, I will just say about Corbyn, I think that you're definitely right in the sense that Corbyn um, has, like, I think, was a little bit more rooted in that kind of international movement than, than Bernie was. But also, I mean, Corbyn was also very quintessentially uh, British in a lot of ways. Yes. I mean, like, he loved his allotment. Um, and he's a very good, you know, uh, vegetable grower and all mm -hmm, that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. So I think that, you know, th that's, that's worthwhile to, to remember, too. Um, but I mean, Certainly, like whatever kind of politics that we're trying to construct is inherently anti-war mm -hmm. and inherently, um, uh, you know, anti-empire in the sense of like yeah. the United States dictating to the rest of the world. Um, and also like something dictating like policies to the rest of the world. And also, again, like this is where it's important to, you know, not, I think, zoom in too much on things that you miss like the whole picture. Because like when we're also talking about empire and like the power of of the american state you also have to remember like what's the biggest tool that they have certainly it's the guns and the big ass military yep. but it's also black rock and wall street yep. right and the fact is, is that these fights that we're having internally right against capitalism against capital um in general like that has a lot of effects that that expand way outside the united states so this is not like saying like only for us exclusively right um it's recognizing that okay well as a as an american there are a lot there are two big engines that create a lot of misery and pain for people and that is like the u.s military and that is also uh you know the u.s financial system mm -hmm. and you know at attacking those weakening the, their power is going to help out people all across the the globe and also help out uh people like in alabama right now mm -hmm. you know where mm -hmm. you have miners on strike for over a year fighting against new york-based wall street capital right um you know so i i i i think that like you know, you don't have to say, I don't find these things to be inherently at odds um, with each other, having an anti-war and internationalist perspective, and also saying, I think that American people deserve better than they're getting from this right. system, right? right? And I think that that's like the trap um, that some folks fall into is they create this like, you know, false binary where it's right. like, well, if you're saying we need to look out for American workers, that means I'm putting up two middle fingers to everybody else, right? <laughs> right. And um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, to all of our, our friends and comrades um, in other countries who are fighting against these systems, they would love if there was like a vibrant working class movement in this country that was right. able to weaken the power of BlackRock, right? Like these things are very helpful to them too. Right, right. Um, and this is why this conversation sometimes gets so frustrating to me because it becomes this like binary and people assume like the worst. And like, I can understand maybe some of the historic reasons why some people are allergic to certain terms. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I, I think especially if you look at the history of, um, you know, socialist movements in other countries, there has always been like, oh, well, our people have this kind of spirit and we want to recognize right. it and unleash it. Right. Um, right. I don't you know, it's 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 bizarre to me that people, uh, you know, think that that's inherently going to be reactionary in the American context. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, on that note, and, and I think that this will be the final question for you, but I have to ask, you're a Texan. Uh, let's let's talk mm -hmm. about Texas pride. You've you've yeah. <laughs> you've brought up uh, Texas a few times uh, throughout the course of this conversation. And um, I I mean, you know, probably at, as I think you were saying earlier, like there's a lot of regional pride in different parts mm -hmm. of the country, right? Texas, I think, has a lot, a lot of pride. We all know not to mess with Texas. Uh, and as you were saying, you know, that I think much like patriotism or nationalism uh, can, can be harnessed to reactionary ends. There's obviously a lot going on in Texas right now. Uh, but uh, you're a proud Texan. Uh, talk to us about Texas pride. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, um, I think this is like a, a place in particular where this fight ends up being really important. Yeah. And this is where, like, when we don't stand up um, for our actual history, you get, you get, you know, um, folks like Abbott and Cruz presenting this completely upside down view of, of Texas history. Like, yeah. maybe to give, like, one quick, like, just a couple of things off off the top, right? Texas, um, you know, has, has a very... Um, violent and and brutal history and it also has a lot of kind of utopian hopeful aspects to its history i mean you know people might not know this but you, you all know karl marx tried to immigrate uh to texas because there was a lot of german socialists who were creating uh, these communities short drive from me there's a town called comfort texas where a bunch of german socialists um had sort of created a, a semi socialist like commune out there 
fervently um, abolitionist. Mm -hmm. uh, when Texas seceded, they sent out the Confederate Army to basically require everybody uh, pledge loyalty to the Confederacy. The people of Comfort, Texas, refused, and there was a skirmish, and they were they were massacred. Mm -hmm. Right. So again, this isn't a win, but this is like this is our history and our spirit. Yeah. I think a larger example, of something that hope I'm working on, hopefully, will be out in in Jackman soon. Um, a, is a history about the uh, the Texas fence cutters, which was this amazing uh, moment in, in our history. And I bring it up, one, because it's an interesting um, story, but two, like, again, I, I'm, I'm a history nerd, so I spent a lot of time on the blogs and stuff. Whenever this story is presented, it's always presented as like, this is when law and order came to Texas and when the Texas Rangers sort of, you know, set property rights on a pedestal here. Um, but what was the fence cutting wars? Again, so that's not the case. Um, what was the fence cutting wars? After the Civil War, the state's completely economically devastated. You have a lot of uh, capital, particularly Northern, but also a lot of European capital coming in and taking advantage of the dire financial um, straits that the, that the society was in. And you started getting these huge land barons who are buying up all of the land. Well, Texas, like many other Western states, has this idea called the open range, wherein the land belongs to the people as a whole, right? So this is like an anti-private property belief that is central like to the very beginning of this place. And when these cattle barons came in, they started taking advantage of a new technology uh, called barbed wire. Other people knew it as the devil's rope. And they started fencing in all of this land. And they did it with a fervor, not only fencing in their land, but they also were fencing over public roads and public lands and things like that. And the people, the poor people, the working class people in Texas were aghast at this new development. So they started to organize themselves into all of these little groups um, called things like the Blue Devils, the Owls, my personal favorite, the Knights of the Nippers. And they would just go around the state and they would cut down barbed wire fences wherever they saw it. And it became a hot war because the land barons started hiring their own thugs to start shooting at people who are cutting down their fences. And then the fence cutters, um, you know, started arming themselves as well. But the entire state was engulf engulfed in this like anti-private property, this enclosure of the commons to use maybe some, you know, yeah. Marxist terms that we like, you know, like this is, is our history. And it was a brutally put down, like mm -hmm. absolutely brutally uh, put down. The Texas Rangers did play a big role. They were coming out there and shooting Texans, including uh, one um, gentleman, uh, a, a Texas Ranger who was uh, found that he, they found, the state found out that he was trying to install bombs around fences across Texas. So that when people came over to uh, cut them, they would blow up, right? I mean, really brutally, brutally put down. Um, and then what happened after that? They lose the fence cutting war. Um, but a lot of those people start joining up in different small town communities and something that became known as the Farmers Alliance, which was a precursor to the Populist Party. As the Populist Party started uh, to continue and grow, it was very vibrant in this state. Um, they realized, okay, well, there's a, there's a tension between rich people and poor people and we can't just have this agrarian versus urban mentality we have to recognize that it's the rich versus the poor a lot of those people ended up becoming early members of the texas socialist party um, which was a very significant factor across the state and um you know politically and you know we know the history of the the socialist party in in america a lot of successes um but also, you know, we don't end up getting, you know, the the socialist you know, system that we want to live under. But th because of that movement, um, you know, when it came time, when the social forces sort of aligned under the New Deal, a lot of these demands that were being made in the early 1900s by these folks were put into place, you know, like things like Social Security, mm -hmm. uh, like like things like national investment um, in our infrastructure. Right. A lot of these demands were met in, in some form or another. Right. And like that's our history. Yeah. And you don't get caught that. And, you know, there's a lot of things that we can sort of pull up um, and, and look back and sort of see what worked, what didn't work um, from from those from those moments. So, like, when I say I'm, I'm proud to be a Texan, I'm happy to be, you know, of the a stock fence of cutter. The people that fence cutters, <laughs> you know, yeah. and like we have like and by the way, y'all, like I always say this and on Left Reckoning, we do a lot of this, like look into your own community, because I promise you. Um, that you have something like that yeah. um, in, in your community. And like, it's been really um, rewarding over the past couple of years to really focus on this and learn all these stories. I mean, I won't go into all of them, but like in St. Louis, for example, um, there was a commune that took over the city and they held it for uh, for weeks until it was put down by the U.S. government, mm -hmm. right? Like they're like, you have it everywhere. 
And I think it's worthwhile for us to be rooted in the, in that history and to understand it. And that's something that I think is um, not only sort of good for us spiritually, um, but I also think good for us politically to remind folks that, you know, socialism and these ideas and these fights that we're in right now are not kind of like foreign importations right. where like America is trying to trail Europe. Mm -hmm. No, they're homegrown mm -hmm. as much as anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that that gives us, a, a, you know, um, that gives us something to, to stand on and stand for that I think is very viable that we shouldn't be so quick to ignore or run away from because the right wing is so confident and comfortable with cloaking themselves in the flag or Trump doing whatever the hell he was doing to it um, at, yeah. at that rally where he was kissing up on it. But, right. you know, <laughs> That's that's there for us, and we should be we should be taking it. Yeah, I 100% agree. David Griscom, again, a co-host of Left Reckoning. We will link that below and look out for his article in Jacobin. David, great to see you as always. Thanks for your time. Of course, thank you so much. If you like this video from the Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks.